Okay, I'm gonna, we're going to go ahead and get started here in the interest of time. Um, everyone, uh, my name is Chad Severs, and I'm the RPS coordinator, and um, welcome to today's webinar. Um, I did want to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. During the presentation, please mute yourself by pressing star six. And to ask a question, um, you can use the chat feature, which is found on the right side of your screen. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, and you can always unmute yourself to um, ask a question. And this webinar is being recorded. We will provide a link to this presentation from our website. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. And if at any time you have difficulty hearing a presenter, um, please unmute yourself and let us know or, again, use that chat feature. So. All right. My name is Nikki Connors Burrow, and um, I'm a faculty member here at UAMS in the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine. And I'm going to be talking today about um, substance abuse and trauma in early childhood. And uh, I appreciate all of you who are on the call um, and willing to spend your lunch hour with us today. And I am uh, figuring out how to move the slides. All right. So um, our objectives today are to really uh, begin to discuss the intergenerational connection between substance abuse, especially substance abuse among mothers, um, and trauma for their children, and to understand the impact of both substance abuse um, and trauma on child outcomes, and to talk about uh, elements of effective treatment for moms with substance abuse problems. Um, first, so I'm going to start with just um, a few statistics about the scope of the problem. Um, so we know that actually uh, many children are living with mothers who abuse substances. In fact, it's about 5% um, of children that we estimate are living with a mom who meets the criteria for substance dependence or abuse. And you can um, double or triple that number if you want to add fathers into the equation. Um, and of course, many more who live with parents who binge um, use or misuse substances in other ways. Um, so looking at these numbers another way, um, we know that in any preschool class, there's at least one child who would likely be affected by maternal substance abuse. Um, and these are two or three times the numbers of kids who are affected by other things we worry about, for example, a peanut allergy. Um, so this really is a widespread problem. And I think there's somebody who might need to mute their mic because I'm getting some sort of background noise there. All right, so um, we're going to talk today about what we know about mothers who can't stop abusing substances even when they're pregnant or parenting. Um, sometimes that's hard for professionals who work especially with children to understand. <clears throat> and so we feel like it's important to understand the sort of history and complexity of the situation that mothers find themselves in and the factors that contribute um, to this situation. And I'm going to be using data from some of our studies right here in Arkansas um, when I talk about uh, this. So when you see stats, these are Arkansas moms that you're seeing stats on. Um, and I'll also look at some national studies uh, which include um, Arkansas moms. Um, and these are moms who've been in treatment, um, in Arkansas treatment programs, oftentimes with their children. So one of the things that we understand about mothers who um, abuse substances uh, while they're pregnant or parenting is that their own abuse history is a substantial piece of the picture. So um, you can see on the slide um, that of mothers who enter treatment here in Arkansas, um, half were sexually abused, three-fourths physically abused growing up. Um, for most of them, this was chronic trauma that was a part of their early childhood experience. More than half of them report this abuse um, occurred uh, at the hands of their parents, and three-fourths report being a victim of abuse by someone other than a parent. Uh, of course, what we know is that being a victim of child abuse, especially sexual abuse, is a common precursor of substance use disorders. Um, so there have been studies, for example, that have shown that women with a history of physical and sexual abuse are are five times as likely to use street drugs and more than twice as likely to abuse alcohol as women who are not maltreated. Um, and stress and stress-related disorders um, are really a big part of the onset of substance use and the continuation of use. So um, 
we talk about, uh, of course, substance use as self-medication sometimes for um, women with a history of abuse and feelings of distress. Um, and also those feelings of distress can play a major role in relapse in people recovering from addiction, especially if their trauma has not been treated. Um, another part of the picture for moms, and of course this won't surprise any of you mental health professionals out there, um, given their trauma history, we often see um, significant mental health disorders. Two of the most common that we see um, are depression and PTSD. Um, so among the mothers that we studied here in Arkansas, uh, we know that most of them will screen positive for depression. It's really just a matter of how severe it is. Um, and so for a third of them, it's severe, for a third of them, it's moderate, and for a, a handful, it's mild. Um, in terms of screening for PTSD, when we've screened moms in treatment, about half of them um, screen positive for um, symptoms of PTSD. And just, you know, sort of a note about mental health and, and parenting and sort of how we get into these intergenerational connections. Um, so even without substance abuse in the picture, these kinds of mental health problems have a serious uh, implications for parenting and for child outcomes. So depression, of course, has been hugely studied as it relates to parenting, and it's a major risk factor for poor child outcomes, including problems with behavior and emotions and problems with school readiness. So depression impacts parenting in a very negative way um, and in different ways for different moms. So some moms may be lethargic and too low energy to meet the needs of the child, or they may be irritable and find themselves being intrusive with the child or harsh with the child. Um, you know, an important other piece is that they, part of depression is the inability to um, get satisfaction or joy out of things that would usually bring you satisfaction. And all of us in our parenting roles um, need that joy from our interaction with children uh, to sort of sustain us um, through the difficult tasks of parenting. Um, that that is uh, going to be dampened in moms who have symptoms of depression. So even without substance abuse in, in the picture, um, what we know in terms of the mental health of these moms uh, means that, they're, uh, that their children are already at risk and that their parenting is at risk. Another part of the picture is really isolation and lack of social support. So um, for moms, especially moms that are using illegal substances, um, they can really come to have a very narrow social circle. By the fact that they're engaging in illegal activities means they have to surround themselves with people to whom those illegal activities are acceptable. Um, and so we know that uh, they, they often, by the time their um, addiction progresses, they wind up having very few relationships with people who are not substance abusers themselves. Um, I also, again, uh, pointing to the intergenerational nature of this, um, we know that most moms whose addiction progresses to the point that they need treatment, um, most of them had parents who had substance use problems themselves, more than half. Um, and for those of you who work with kids, and especially in the child welfare system, um, this is you know, often an issue related to kinship care um, that I like to point out. Of course, we all know that kinship care can be a wonderful thing for kids in the child welfare system, um, but sometimes we make assumption about the health and well-being of the people providing that care. So we've actually studied um, moms with addictions whose children went to live with their grandparents and found that about half the time, those were the very grandparents who abused the mom, and those were the very grandparents who had substance disorders themselves. So we want to be careful about making assumptions about the health of the, the family of origin. Depression and suicide and substance abuse and all that. <clears throat> so, um, so why do we focus on these issues of the mom, um, especially for people who work with kids? Um, we really like to just remind professionals um, to have empathy for the mom and that we have to recognize how these problems become intergenerational if we're going to be successful in stopping the, the cycle. And that means more than just um, supporting the child, that means supporting the mom and the family system as well. So I want to talk a little bit more in depth about what we know um, all of this uh, means for their children. What does it mean to live with a mom who has um, some of these serious risk factors going on. Um, how does it impact the parenting role? How does it uh, increase risk for the child? <clears throat> so one thing we know is that 
Um, mothers with substance abuse problems often make destructive decisions, um, decisions that aren't good for their kids or good for their family. Um, and that can be really hard to understand when we know these moms love their kids. Um, but what we have to remember is that addiction is a brain disease. Um, we now know from brain imaging studies um, that there are physical changes in the areas of the brain that are important to judgment and decision making and learning and memory and behavioral control. And scientists believe that these changes come about from substance use. They change the way that the brain works, and they may help explain some of the compulsive and destructive behaviors of addiction. Um, and any of you who've worked with families impacted by addiction know that moms can become completely preoccupied with the addiction um, to the point of neglect of the child. Um, so we know that 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 some of the ways that that evidences itself um, is that they're diverting household resources for the purchase of alcohol or other drugs, that there's a lot of time and energy invested in seeking drugs, manufacturing the drugs, finding the money to purchase the drugs, using the drugs. Um, and we've already sort of touched on some of the um, isolation issues. Um, but, of course, another key issue is the illegal nature of um, use of illegal drugs, which, of course, means involvement with the legal system, arrests, incarceration, child welfare involvement. We'll talk a little bit more about um, arrests and what that means for, for children as we go on. Um, I also want to, um, while we're talking about um, addiction as a, as a brain disease, um, comment on what that means for the parenting role as well. Um, so there's actually some evidence beginning uh, to accumulate now that suggests that the, kind, the parts of the area of the brain that can be damaged by substance use are also the same parts of the brain that we need to respond as parents to the cues of our infants. Um, so we now know um, from fMRI studies of mothers with and without addictions that some of that neural circuitry involved in responding to children can be damaged. So, for example, there was a recent study out of Yale where they did fMRIs on uh, addicted moms and non-addicted moms. And while they were in the MRI, they actually showed them pictures um, and play them sounds of either happy babies or crying and distressed babies. And what we see is that in substance using mothers, their brain is actually slower to respond um, to the happy or to the sad baby. They're actually slower to read the cues of their infants. And so that may be some of the reason that we see some of the challenge in parenting um, in mothers with addictions. So I want to talk a little bit, too, um, about how risks begin to accumulate in the life of a child living in a home with a mother with a substance abuse problem. Um, and this risk, um, as you guys well know, really begins prenatally um, with the impact of mom's stress on the fetus as well as of her substance use. Um, so we know now that um, while many of us worry um, about the impact of um, substances like cocaine and methamphetamine on the fetus, we actually know that alcohol has the most consistent and dramatic effects on the developing fetus. Um, we, kn we know this from, you know, many study over, studies over many decades, and that the impact of alcohol use on the fetus can actually be quite dramatic. In fact, it's the leading cause of um, brain damage. Uh, leading preventable cause of brain damage for the for children. Um, of course, cocaine and methamphetamine can have effects as well, though not quite uh, the the very frightening um, effects we once uh, concerned ourselves with when we all watched on the news about the crack baby scares of the 1990s. Now that we know that cocaine may result in a greater likelihood of premature birth, uh, low birth weight, uh, children who are exposed to cocaine may have um, some difficulty with a executive function skills that we'll talk more about in a minute, so difficulty focusing their attention, um, having some uh, pr problems with impulse control. Um, but the main point that I want to make about prenatal exposure is that we just have to be really careful about labeling um, children related to their prenatal exposure. Um, when we label a child as being drug exposed, that is part of the picture, but for some professionals, um, teachers, others, they may have lower ex expectations for the child, and they also have a tendency to ignore other possible causes 
of the problems that the child may be having in school um, or at home. And as we're going to be talking about today, there's many other possible causes for uh, the problems in behavior um, or academics that we may see in these kids, including the fallout from the chronic and complex trauma that they've been experiencing. So we're going to talk about kind of the likelihood that these kids have been exposed to multiple traumas and the many other risk factors um, that are, are a part of the picture of their lives. So to talk a little bit about cumulative risk, I know that this is probably a concept that's familiar um, to many of you. Um, many of us, of course, experienced a risk factor growing up like poverty or um, being raised by a parent with low education, and, and we're, we're okay. We're functioning professionals. Um, and, of course, what we know about cumulative risk is that in most cases, um, a single risk factor in your life is not going to result in a major developmental problem. It's really the buildup of risk factors that poses the greatest threat to the child. So there have been many very large-scale national studies um, of the way that risk factors work in the lives of children and how the accumulation of risk factors um, is really the problem. So we see, for example, in some of these, in the results from these um, large national studies, um, that on average, if you track the IQ of children and the number of risk factors they have, on average, you'll see a four-point decrease in IQ for each additional risk factor a child has. You'll also um, see this evidence with behavior problems and psychiatric disorders. Um, so if you have kids who have four or more risk factors are five times as likely to have serious problems in behavior. Um, you can see this with psychiatric disorders too. So, um, for example, there have been studies that show that in children whose families have um, zero or one risk factor, um, the likelihood of a psychiatric problem for the child by adolescence is about 2%. Once you get into four risk factors and above, um, you're talking about 20% um, of children having a diagnosable psychiatric disorder. Um, so what are the kinds of uh, risk factors that we're talking about? Um, you guys can look at these. And um, when I speak to audiences um, like this one, um, usually most of us had either no major risk factor or maybe one or two. Um, and you can see that some of them um, are um, maybe damaging, but you could see how it would be overcome, like frequent moves. Um, and others are much more serious. And, of course, you guys, with your training um, in trauma, know that domestic violence and exposure to crime and violence um, and abuse um, are some of the most damaging risk factors. So what about cumulative risk in the lives of children who live with moms who abuse drugs? Um, so we know from studies, including studies of Arkansas families, um, we've looked at the risk factors in the lives of thousands of children who entered treatment programs with their moms. Um, in one particular study, we examined 11 risk factors that we happen to have data on. And on average, for children um, entering treatment with their moms, um, they had six and a half risk factors. So if you kind of think about that um, in relationship to what we see in the national studies for outcomes of kids with multiple risk factors, once you start getting into the range of six and a half risk factors, we're expecting about five times the risk of behavior problems of a typical child and a major 20-plus um, point um, impact on IQ on average. Um, for me, I feel that a really key risk and sort of often overlooked um, in families with substance use problems is their exposure to crime and violence. So we've actually studied this here in Arkansas with children um, enrolled in treatment with their mothers, and we've asked them about their exposure to different kinds of crime and violence. And in the small sample of children in our study, we found that 100% had been exposed to, to criminal or violent acts. And the amount of their exposure and the different types of their exposure was not surprisingly related to problems in self-control um, and aggressive kinds of behavior, as well as um, a strong predictor of their problems with anxiety. So just to be a little bit more specific about that, um, this graph just shows um, children's report of how many times they experienced um, just a few examples of these um, types of crime or violence. and so. You can see that almost two-thirds of the kids reported having seen grown-ups in their home hit each other, and for about 40% of them, that was something that happened many, many times, a chronic and ongoing trauma. 
Um, and of course, you can see um, that a surprising number of children um, saw drug deals, some of them many times, um, heard gunshots, witnessed arrests. Um, and for many of the, them, those arrests were arrests of a parent. Um, you know, and you can imagine the, the trauma associated with seeing your parent be arrested. Of course, an interesting part of this is that um, when you talk to professionals who work with the mothers um, with substance abuse problems, often the mothers really have tried to protect their children and often think that they have succeeded. Their reports will be very different from what you see here. They may think that the child didn't know what was going on because they closed the bedroom door. Um, or because the child was asleep. But when we talk to the children, of course, we learn that they've been exposed to far more than the adults have realized. And um, given your tra um, training in trauma, um, I'm sure the um, fallout of this is probably obvious too. <coughs> so, of course, risk factors don't tell the whole story in a family. Um, we know that other factors make it more likely that children can overcome difficult circumstances. Um, some factors can promote resilience. Um, we call these protective factors. But unfortunately, given the chaos and instability that often surrounds these children's lives, they often have limited opportunities to develop either the personal um, protective factors or the relational protective factors that may help buffer them against risk. So they're going to ha be less likely to have seen good modeling of skills for emotional regulation and social interaction. Um, they're going to be, of course, less likely to have the kind of stimulating home environment that facilitates uh, readiness for school or school success. Um, and they're less likely, of course, to have the kind of supportive relationships they need with, with adults to help them, to help them grow. Um, so you, we know that for children living in um, homes with maternal substance abuse, um, that they're just less likely to have the kinds of relationships and experiences um, that are listed here on the screen that, that we know help children overcome risks. Because we've already described how many of these things are, are negatively impacted when moms use substances. So uh, what happens then? Uh, what do we know about the outcomes of these children? Um, what do we know about Arkansas children who've been living in these kind of circumstances? And how likely is it that they'll have problems? Um, so we've studied preschool children in Arkansas whose mothers were in treatment. And the children were enrolled in child care or kindergarten. And we um, got uh, teacher reports um, of their behavior using standardized instruments. And um, in this study, what we found is more than half of the children had clinically elevated problems with behavior. Uh, we studied anxiety in school-age children whose moms are in treatment. Um, and in that case, again, we found that about thir a third um, have clinically elevated problems with anxiety. Um, we haven't studied uh, PTSD specifically, <clears throat> but if I had to guess, um, I would say it would probably parallel some of our findings with anxiety. Developmental delay um, is also a big issue for these kids. And what we see with these kids is really consistent with what you often see in studies of children living in serious poverty. Um, so they may start out looking pretty typical um, after birth, especially if they were um, not born prematurely. Um, but as time goes on, because of the kinds of environment they're in, they start to fall further and further behind. Um, so generally what we see is that about a third of kids are very resilient. Um, and, you know, even as they enter school, um, you know, they seem to be doing fine developmentally. Um, another third shows signs of difficulties or screen as being at risk for developmental delay. But when we retest them after three months in a nurturing environment with um, supports for any developmental delays they may have, um, they'll screen typical again. So these are kids who didn't really have anything major wrong with them. It's just that they may never have been in, in an environment that was uh, consistent, safe, responsive, and nurturing and where they were um, stimulated developmentally. Um, for another third, the fix is not as easy, and they don't move as quickly on the developmental measures. Um, for those children, there may be something more serious going on from the prenatal exposure. There may be some um, deficits that are deeper and uh, may take more work to overcome. 
So I want to talk for just a few minutes um, about the impact of um, substance abuse and trauma on executive functioning skills, um, which is part of the reason uh, we understand that some kids who've been prenatally exposed to substances and have had these life experiences of trauma may have difficulty doing well in school, may have some difficulty um, with behavior and impulse control. Um, so some of you um, may be familiar with um, executive function, um, but um, basically um, these are skills that are the foundation for both learning and successful social interaction. It's the focus, the remembering, and the planning that allows us to learn. It's the, I like to say it's the how of learning. Um, and so these are really skills that we're not born with. Um, we begin to develop them in infancy, and they begin to develop really with supportive, consistent, and responsive caregiving. And of course, our experiences um, are the kinds of caregiving we receive either fosters or undermine these skills. And um, two of the factors that we know are most directly related to executive functioning skills are prenatal exposure to alcohol and other drugs and experiences with trauma. And of course, for kids in substance abusing homes, those two things are often happening together, creating kind of a double, double whammy uh, potential impact for kids. So um, there's a few important aspects to executive functioning. Um, one is working memory. And working memory is just really how we hold and use information in our head. Um, so remembering a phone number long enough to dial it, um, following two or three step directions. So if we tell a child to pick up their socks from the living room and put them in the laundry basket, then they're having to use their working memory until they've followed through on both pieces of that, um, of that uh, two-step direction. Um, when children don't comply, um, Sometimes that might look like um, defiance or not listening when, in fact, there's a possibility that it's a, that it's a problem with the working memory. Inhibitory control has a um, couple of pieces to it. Um, one is being able to focus when we're distracted, um, and the other is being able to inhibit our actions even when our emotions are high. Um, so if you think about this, um, children who, um, you know, if they're sitting in circle time in a preschool classroom, um, the child who can focus on the teacher reading the book, even when the child next to them is squirming and wiggling and acting out, has wonderful inhibitory control. Um, and uh, the other piece of inhibitory control is, you know, how we have self-control um, even when we're feeling emotional. So I always like to joke that I have better inhibitory control with my, than my husband does because when I'm driving, if someone cuts me off in traffic, I'll at least wait and look and see if I know them before I lay on my horn, um, whereas he just does it immediately. Um, so we know that kids practice these um, skills in games. Um, so games like red light, green light, where kids have to stop and go and inhibit themselves are, uh, are great ways that they practice these skills. So another piece of executive function is mental flexibility. So learning um, that there are different rules um, in different settings and being able to adjust to changing demands and priorities. Um, so for very young kids, um, this may be things like understanding that I have my inside voice and my outside voice that I can run outside, but I have to use my walking feet inside. Um, it will evidence itself in grammar uh, use, too. So they might say, um, my picture is the goodest, but eventually they learn that there's different grammar rules, and, and they'll say, my picture is the best. Um, so it's, it's sort of uh, becoming adaptable to the different rules in different situations. These are all components of executive function. And we have extremely high expectations for children's executive function, um, even at a very young age. Um, so they need these executive function skills just to navigate daily life. These are critical um, for school readiness. So they need them to control their impulses so that they can listen to the teacher. Um, they need it so that they can follow the rules in the classroom. And they need it so that they can navigate social play. Um, kids who cannot, uh, who have trouble with executive function skills tend to, to cause play scenarios to fall apart and uh, typically become the children that nobody wants to play with. Um, this slide just shows us how executive function skills um, build through childhood and how we get um, much of the executive function skills um, that we're expected to have before we enter uh, first grade. Um, there's really explosive growth before children enter school, and this really um, 
determines whether they're going to be successful in school or not. Um, so by the time they're in pre-K, um, we expect them to know the inside-outside rules and be able to follow them. We sometimes even expect them to be able to follow a complex sequence of directions. Um, some kids can, and for others it's harder. For kids that have experienced prenatal substance exposure or experienced trauma, these skills may be delayed and they need patient teaching. And we know that this is very hard for teachers and it's very hard for parents. Um, if you survey pre-K teachers about the skills that they want kids to enter kindergarten with, um, it's not the ones you would think. They don't necessarily care if the child can count um, or knows their ABCs. They care that the child can listen and can focus and can pay attention. And so sometimes these are kids that are difficult to have in your classroom. Um, so as we've already said, um, Children with delayed executive function skills um, can be a challenge to teachers, and this is going to be fairly common among kids with prenatal exposure to substances or a history of trauma. And we really have to work to help teachers, parents, and others that are working with these children think about it like they think about other kinds of delays. So when a child has a speech delay or a motor skill delay, um, we don't get angry at them. We understand that they need special support um, and um, special, uh, you know, therapies to help them catch up. And we meet them where we are and we help them progress forward. And we really have to help teachers think about some of these executive function delays um, in the same way and parents as well. Um, so we have to um, avoid placing demands on children that overtax their capabilities. Um, and provide and accommodate our environment and accommodate um, our expectations to help the child move forward. So just as an example of that, um, if you have a young child with delays in executive function skills and they can't sit through uh, a teacher reading a whole book without uh, getting themselves into trouble or without um, running off, um, then we have to treat them like they have the, we have to figure out sort of where they are developmentally in their executive function skills and treat them accordingly. So if they have the executive function skills of a two-year-old, then we read to them like a two-year-old. We pick a book on their absolutely favorite topic. We read to them individually, uh, maybe cuddling with them in our lap, and we read as much as they can tolerate. We give them lots of praise, and we send them on their way. Um, and then we work on that, um, lengthening that and lengthening that, expanding that um, as they can tolerate it and as their skills build. Um, I also, uh, for those of you who work with adults, want you to think about this in relationship to your adult clients. So problems with impulse control, problems with following directions, problems focusing and planning, carrying out plans, adapting to change. Um, I'm willing to bet that you sometimes see those in your adult clients. <laughs> so we have to remember that they too likely experience trauma. They may have been prenatally exposed to substances, and these may have undermined their executive function skills to this day. Um, they may need additional support um, to be able to meet their goals. I think about this a lot in relationship to moms in the child welfare system. So uh, for moms with delays in their executive function skills, their case plan may be absolutely overwhelming to them, and they may need scaffolding and support um, to help them be able to make plans uh, that will allow them to meet those goals. So part of creating a trauma-informed system is that when we know the likelihood of trauma is high, like it is among um, moms with substance use problems, moms in the child welfare system, then we have to see that, assume that some of their behaviors uh, that we're seeing have their roots in trauma, and we have to think about how we approach the moms so that we're not creating additional trauma for them. So I want to speak for a few minutes about what clinical interventions look like for moms with substance abuse problems and, and their own trauma history. So um, this scary looking slide here um, is what the National Institutes of Health recommends um, as the components of comprehensive substance abuse treatment. So the inner circle includes services that should, at a minimum, be offered in a substance abuse treatment program. Um, these are the things you would expect to see in any treatment program. Um, so self-help and peer support groups, um, drug testing, um, case management, 
uh, therapies, continuing care, you know, relapse prevention kinds of things. And then the outer circle are things that can sometimes be overlooked but are actually really critical to the success of folks in treatment, especially we know the success of moms who are managing not just their needs but the needs of their family. So um, what are the child care arrangements? Um, how are we addressing their medical needs? Really critically, how are we addressing their mental health services um, and their own uh, history of trauma? So making that slide a little more concrete, what does it um, typically look like? Uh, so usually we're talking about residential or outpatient treatment um, with safe drug-free housing. Um, these, when you talk about moms with a serious substance addiction to the point that they couldn't stop using in their pregnancy or while parenting, um, typically we're talking about an addiction that's fairly severe and outpatient um, treatment is often not likely to be sufficient unless it's paired with, um, you know, some kind of safe housing option uh, because we know that these moms often are really just surrounded. Um, their whole social circle is made up of people who um, use substances. Um, so education, not just on um, alcohol and drugs, but um, the comprehensive programs for moms should have um, education on parenting and life skills. Um, so mental health um, for the mom, um, for the mother and child, um, and for the family, if there's dad in the picture or others involved. And, um, and I will say that um, the mental health component for us here in Arkansas is often not the part that we do best in many of our substance abuse treatment programs. That's certainly not true of all of them. Um, but often there's been um, not a full integration of um, mental health and substance abuse treatment services. And um, as we've seen, uh, given the mental health needs of the, of the moms, um, that's something that we really can't afford to neglect. And of course, um, physical health uh, issues. So for we have in our state um, seven mother-child treatment programs. And in the best of those programs, children are really children are really thought of as clients too, not an afterthought. So when these programs were first begun, it was really with the idea that we had to address the needs of children because that was a barrier to mom's treatment. Um, but we've sort of moved beyond that now. We realize that the children have their own sets of needs and um, and need to be considered clients um, with a with a full array of services available to them as well. Um, so we're looking for them to be screened. Um, we want them to have quality, high quality child care during the mom's treatment day is extremely important. They need to be in a stimulating environment to help them catch up. Um, they may need early intervention services, OT, PT, speech. Um, and I would argue that a critically missing piece um, of treatment for most children in our um, substance abuse treatment programs that serve moms and children is trauma-specific mental health services like TFCBT, like child parent psychotherapy. Um, those are not widely available and we really got to work better to create linkages between those of you who are trained in these kinds of approaches and our substance abuse treatment providers. These kids almost universally have had experiences of trauma. They need a thorough trauma assessment and they need appropriate services. And I will say that in our evaluations of these kinds of mother-child treatment programs, we already talked about how about half of the kids have clinically elevated problems with behavior, and we do not see those problems with behavior reduce as quickly as we do developmental problems and delays for the kids. And I have really come to believe it's because we've sort of missed the trauma picture with these kids. We've missed the fact that this is um, a big part of their history, and we have not provided the kinds of trauma-specific services that they need um, to really move forward. That was my personal opinion, by the way. I don't have research to back that up. Um, so I always like to speak just a moment about whether treatment works because lots of people have uh, different ideas about that or misconceptions about that. Um, and so, um, you know, 
even if people think it works, they're not sure about our programs here. Um, but we've actually studied hundreds of moms and treatment programs in Arkansas, and we have tracked them in some studies for a year and some studies for three years um, after they leave treatment. And what we know is that about half of those moms who receive uh, treatment have continued abstinence for alcohol and drugs for the period of time of our study. Um, about half of the moms have some kind of relapse. Um, uh, half of that half have have a brief relapse and they tweak their treatment plan as needed and they return to sobriety during the period of time that we're tracking them, which leaves us with about a quarter of the moms that really um, have sort of ongoing um, relapses that don't resolve uh, fairly quickly and that continue for the period of time that we track them. But those kinds of outcomes are actually as good or better than um, relapse rates for any other chronic diseases that we know about, like diabetes, asthma, hypertension. Um, and so we have to really think about some of these um, symptoms of substance use problems um, as symptoms and, uh, and a need to look at the treatment plan. So as symptoms um, reemerge, we, we treat tweak the treatment plan, um, treating this like it's a chronic disease um, like diabetes or asthma. Um, we've studied many other outcomes of treatment, um, and we know that moms who go to treatment, um, we see huge and significant um, increases in self-sufficiency measures like employment, um, stable housing, being in their own housing. Um, we see um, pretty startling reductions in mental health symptoms. Um, and uh, we see uh, quick improvements in child developmental delays. Um, just to say a little bit more about what kinds of services are most effective for mothers, especially mothers with serious victims. Um, so we know that um, that gender-specific and trauma-informed approaches um, are what are recommended for these mothers. So um, we need, you need to be looking for staff members that have a thorough understanding of the impact of trauma, where there's a thorough trauma assessment, where there's development of safety plans, um, where there is intentional care taken to reduce the likelihood of triggering the mother, um, and, and assisting the client in managing their overwhelming emotions that may be um, a trigger for relapse for them. Um, in terms of length or intensity of treatment, just like with all medical care, there needs to be a good match between the progression of the disease and the intensity of treatment. So just like a good diet alone is not going to be enough to manage all forms of diabetes, outpatient treatment is not going to be enough for people whose addiction has progressed to pretty serious levels. Um, and so oftentimes they need residential um, and fairly long-term treatment. Um, while 30-day programs are um, common, we actually um, have a lot of evidence that says that moms uh, need a, at least 90 days um, of treatment um, to, to increase the likelihood of their success after treatment. And we're not, we know, we've known that for a long time, but as we learn more and more about the impact of substance use on their brain, we now understand that, that the brain impacts of substance use are part of the reason that folks need a little bit longer length of time in treatment. Um, so we talked a little bit about the physical changes in the area of the brain that are critical to good judgment and decision making and controlling behavior. And and the folks need time for those parts of the brain that have been affected to begin to repair themselves so that by the time they leave treatment, they have better decision-making abilities and better control um, over their impulses, which is what they're going to need uh, to maintain their abstinence from substances. Many uh, folks need continuing care, um, and that may be associated with a treatment program, or they may find that um, in association with a self-help group. Um, and of course, medication management that, that, that may be needed over the long term. Um, so if you don't work in the field um, of substance abuse treatment, but you work with these kinds of families in child welfare, um, in your mental health practice, um, uh, in your work with children, um, what is your role? Um, so, of course, we encourage everybody, regardless of their setting, who works with these families, to always screen for substance use problems in the family and take a complete trauma history. Um, and we have to identify good referral partners. Um, so who are the partners in your community that can offer substance abuse treatment services that are trauma-informed? 
if the trauma-specific services aren't there, how do you partner with them um, so that we can put together a full package of uh, services? Um, well, you want the kinds of services for children that we talked about. And you're not typically going to find trauma-specific services for children um, in-house in many of these um, substance abuse treatment programs. Um, so that's going to take uh, the work of um, case management and others to sort of put together the package of services that kids are going to need. Um, and of course, helping moms um, build back their support network. So for these moms that have um, burned bridges with most most healthy support um, folks that they have, who can help? Who can rebuild those? Are there family? Is there a church that can be supportive? Um, how, how, does our, how do our agencies help moms begin to kind of rebuild a healthy support network, which they'll need um, as they leave treatment? Um, that's really the end of my talk, but these are some, if you want to do some additional reading, um, these are some uh, interesting resources. The first one um, is uh, really helpful in, in, a, in providing a pretty simple um, explanation of some of the science of addiction and the impact of addiction on the brain. Um, the second one really talks about um, the needs of women um, in mental health and substance abuse treatment and um, how do we address those competently. And of course, I'm sure y'all are all familiar with the NCTSN um, where, we're, where we always pull information from. Um, so we have, um, I think, just a few minutes left and so you, we can open it up for questions. Um, and let's see, Chad has put on the screen about the next webinar, which is uh, in November, and it's evidence-based interventions for young children. And I believe that's going to be talking about parent-child interaction therapy and child-parent psychotherapy, um, two interventions for young children that we've got folks trained in at UIMS and, and would like to see wider. Someone has typed in a question, can we obtain a copy of this PowerPoint presentation? And yes, we'd be happy to provide that. Um, Chad, should they email you? or? Oh, okay. Chad says he'll send it to the group. Uh, can you please send the resources? Yes, that'll be on the PowerPoint. Other questions, thoughts, or comments? For you typers, we'll give you another moment to type. Okay, well, thank you for being with us today, um, and we'll look forward to uh, being together again in November.